right, let's take our Bibles tonight and open up back with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35, and just put a temporary marker here uh, because our first uh, batch of questions or our first answers is going to take us to this. So Isaiah chapter 35 tonight, we're going to finish this out and then we're going to head on to something different uh, once we get out of the book of Isaiah. I know prophecy can be a bit overwhelming, and as you study the Old Testament, it might seem a bit impossible to sort through. However, just remember, like we said last uh, Wednesday night, that a lot of times when you're reading these prophetic passages, especially going through the Old Testament, you will see things that are presented that had a temporary, immediate, partial fulfillment. But the complete fulfillment is something way in the future. And you can tell because as you line up the history books with the events that happened, as well as with the remainder of Scripture, you can see that to some degree this has already been fulfilled, but the greater fulfillment of it is to come. Isaiah chapter 35 uh, brings about another question. The majority of these events that we look at in the book of Isaiah are going to happen in the last half of the seven-year tribulation period that's also known as the Great Tribulation. So is Isaiah 35, this is question 91, is Isaiah 35 talking about the New Jerusalem? So let's take a look at a verse that's going to help us out with this. Isaiah 35, verse 10. The Bible says, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow, and sighing shall flee away. What a neat passage of Scripture to read there. We learned a chorus that went with this. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, because they are going to come forth with joy. The Bible tells us that that day is coming, where the land of Israel, where the Jewish people... And remember something else. When you're reading the Old Testament, you're reading about what's going to happen with the Jewish people, God's people. This isn't about the church. It's not about the Gentile world. It is about the Jews. And they are looking forward to the day that they can come back into their land. Now, Isaiah 35, 10 actually answers the question when you put it together with where we were at last week in Isaiah 34. Isaiah chapter 34 was about the judgment of the nations. The judgment of the nations is going to take place at the end of the tribulation period prior to the entrance into the millennial kingdom. Therefore, Isaiah 35 ushers us into the millennial kingdom, or that's what it's about, not ushering us into it, but that's what it's about. The millennial kingdom, it's not about the new Jerusalem. As you study this book, you're going to find out that the Lord will take you through the major events of prophecy, and He'll take us through this step, He'll take us through this step, take us through this step, and then it's kind of like on the old manual typewriters, you remember how you had to move the carriage back? You go, ding, we start all over again on a new line, ding, and that's kind of what you're going to find when you're reading the prophetic books like Isaiah. The Lord's going to take you through just a little bit. He's going to take you through, you know, the judgment of the nation, great tribulation, judgment of the nations, going into the millennial kingdom, ding, let's go back and let's talk some more about tribulation period. And this cycle happens constantly as you're reading throughout prophecy. Now, we're talking about Zion here. The ransom of the Lord shall return and come into Zion. Zion is a reference primarily to Jerusalem. Let's go to Psalm chapter 87. Psalm chapter 87. By the way, it's interesting. Uh, Fox News had an article this week, and I, I should have printed it off. I should have printed off more details about it, so I'm, my memory of it is foggy. But... They have discovered in Israel some gems that have never been found before. And some of those gems line up with some of the descriptions of gems that are found in the Bible. It was stuff that up to now we hadn't heard, didn't know anything about it. We, it was like, well, what is that? Well, we're not real sure. We are now because they found them. This one company has found these gems and have been marketing them. So go to Fox News, type in rare gems found in Israel, and it will pop up a link, and you'll be able to go and read about it. I thought it was a very, very interesting article. Psalm 87, though, verses 2 and 3. 
The Bible says that the Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God, Selah. Think about that. In spite of all Israel has done, their sin, their rebellion, God still loves them. And God is going to still do something great with the nation of Israel. Folks, keep your eye on the nation of Israel. Keep watching what's going on there. God's got a great plan for them. And we have the privilege of watching that plan unfold. So right now, that plan is unfolding before our very eyes. Going back to Isaiah chapter 35, verses 3 and 4. This is probably one of the best things to gather out of this. As you read through this, verses 3 and 4, it says, Strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. In context, the Lord is speaking to the Jewish people. They've grown weary with their wanderings. They are exhausted by their enemies. Their sins are landing them into one captivity after another. I can't even imagine how discouraged the people must be. Now you say, well, they brought it on themselves. How many times have you run into somebody that is at the lowest point in their life? They are just flat on the dirt just about. And the temptation is to go by them and say, well, they brought it on themselves. And we can look and name off all the things that they did that got them in that position. And we might be 100% right. We might not be wrong in the least little bit. We, yep, you're right. Financially, because they made really stupid, foolish, ignorant, bad financial choices. Um, health issues, because they didn't take care of themselves. And they did this, and they did this, and they did this, and they did this. And, and marital messes. Oh, well, yeah, because they were this way, and they were this way, and they were this way. And we may be 100% right. But what good does it do for us to walk by that individual that's flat on their face in the dirt and say, you deserve to be there? What good does that do? And even our God takes a look at Israel. Israel has done horrific things against God. And yet God says, I still love you. Don't be weary. Don't be downtrodden. Be strong. Fear not. Your God will come with vengeance. What this reminds me, you know what the millennial kingdom reminds me of, makes me think of? It's the fact that we have a God that instills hope in us. He instills hope. The Jewish people, they have got hope because there is a millennial kingdom coming someday. There is, yeah, great tribulation, terrible seven years, but many are going to come to know Jesus as Messiah. Hope is not over for Israel. And tonight, I don't know what your situation is, but I can tell you hope is not over. Our God is an awesome, forgiving loving, restoring God. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Hosea, chapter 6. You say, Hosea, where's that? Okay, if you kept your marker in Daniel chapter 9, back up one book. And you're going to bump into the book of... No, I'm wrong. Did I go the wrong direction? I did. Go forward one book. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yeah, find Daniel and go ahead one book, not back one book. And look with me in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 1. And what a great reminder this should be to all of us. This, isn't, this is directed at Israel, okay? If we keep it in context, it is directed at Israel. But great application can be made to us. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for He hath torn... And he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Was it not the Lord that disciplined Israel? Is it not the Lord that led them into the place of captivity? Is it not the Lord that brought the enemy in to devour them? Yes. They have been torn by the Lord. They have been smitten by him. And they said, let's go back to him. Because we also know that he will heal, and he will bind us up. If tonight you have come to church and your heart is heavy 
and, and you kind of feel like maybe the nation of Israel, you're just down in the dirt. And you say, there is no hope. I have made such a train wreck of my life. I have made so many mistakes. There is no hope. That is the devil talking to you who says there's no hope. You tell the devil to shut up. You're going to listen to what the Lord has to say. The Lord does not say there's no hope. He says, I am your hope. I am your strength. You run back to the one that's torn. You run back to the one that, that has smitten, and he will heal. He will bind up. Do you believe that tonight, Christian? Do you know anybody that, that needs that, that you could share that with? Because I'll tell you what, if somebody is down and out in your world, and they feel like they are just face down in the dirt, they have got hand over fist people stepping on them as they're in the dirt. You ever watch a mob, the mob mentality, when somebody um, falls down in a, in a crowded arena or something like that, and how many people get trampled to death? You say, well, why didn't somebody stop to pick them up? Good chance nobody even knew they were there. Once they were down, and if they did, they said, well, I can't do that because then I'll get run over. And people just trample across that individual. How many people tonight are being trampled on? People that we know. You know what, Christians? Don't be another person in the stampede over them. Be the person that reaches down and says, let me tell you where there's hope. Let me tell you where there's hope. Had the opportunity last Friday night, a young man had broke down fortuitously in our church parking lot. And we were going to Walmart to, because my wife needed to get something that she had forgotten and said, I'll, I can do it tomorrow when I get off work. And I thought, no, because I'm a nice, nice husband. I said, no, you're going to be tired. Let's go tonight. So we went. And here's this guy sitting on the back of his car. And he is as despondent as he can possibly be. Pulled in and says, what's going on? He says, ran out of gas. This is where I'm at. You can just, he's crying, just a wreck. He said, okay, you want to talk? Need gas? Nope, just need to sit here and contemplate for a while. Didn't know what that meant, but okay. So we went on to Walmart and picked him up a sandwich and um, something to drink. Came back probably 15, 20 minutes later and said, great talk? Yeah. He says, you want something to eat? Boy, that'd be great. Okay. So we spent about half an hour just standing out talking, and he was a guy that he was hopeless. He says, I got friends. He says, there's nobody that will come and help me. And I says, well, why do you suppose we're here tonight? And to be able to tell somebody that there is hope in Jesus and to share the gospel with them, I tell you what, that is only the Lord can do that. Only the Lord can open up the opportunities where you could look at this guy and there was a lot about him where you could have said, yeah, I bet you are down the dirt. I bet you have made a train wreck of things. I bet this, I bet that. He didn't need that. He needed to know that there's hope in Christ. That the Lord loved him. That somebody else cared enough about him to reach out to him. Who shows up in your life that you could do that for? I mean, think about it. How many opportunities do we miss of being able to show people that there is hope in the Lord? All right, let's move to Isaiah 52. Questions are not connected, uh, but keep us in the same book of the Bible at least. So Isaiah 52, uh, let's start in verse 13. And we're going to keep reading into chapter 53. So Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred, more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. 
So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had been, not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. As you read the passage, we know what the passage is referring to. It is a reference to the Messiah that is to come. But here's the question. Question number 92 why is this written in past tense? Why is it written in past tense? Isaiah is a pre-gospel book, right? And yet, as you read through the description, he is, so that's present tense, but also you will see throughout it, he was putting it in past tense. A lot of it's in past tense. Why? I have read those passages so many times, I don't even have count. Never once have I wondered or thought about that. Never gave that an ounce of thought. And I just thought it was probably a literary device that Isaiah was using. So I started doing some digging. I thought, well, I wonder if anybody else has ever thought about this. Oh my, I couldn't believe it. When I typed in the question into a Google search, just tons of questions where people ask, why is this in past tense? Why is it in past tense? Why is it in past tense? I'm like, wow, there's a lot of people that have thought about that. Which brings up an awesome point. As we have been dealing with these questions, somebody has asked a question, and maybe like me, you go, I never thought about that before. But then there's others that said, yeah, I've wondered that myself. And they never filled out a question. They never turned it in. Just because you have a question and, and, it's, and it's, you say, well, I bet nobody's ever thought about this. I will guarantee you, if you've got the question, somebody else has thought about it. And if you say, well, I've never thought about that. Well, good. Start thinking with me. It's always fun to think in areas you've never thought about before, right? Right? How many of you like to think? Put your hand Do you like to think? Okay, about half of you do. All right, the rest of you are going, not really. Not really. I just, no, no. Well, for the thinkers, let me give you the answer to this. Um, and it's, to me, I'm thinking, it's so simple yet profound all at the same time. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. You say it's the middle of the week. I, I, my thinkers just got so much left for Thursday and Friday, right? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. The Bible says here, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, past tense is constantly used here by Peter. And rightfully so, because Peter is talking about events that have already happened. So we understand why he says it in a past tense. But verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times to you or for you. Let us never forget that although the Bible has many human authors, the Bible really only has one author, and that's God. And all Scripture is breathed by inspiration of God. And so the inspired Scripture that's in Isaiah chapter 53 
God's the one that inspired it in past tense. Isaiah wasn't slipping with his quill on the parchment and thought, well, I'm just going to mix up the tenses and confuse people for centuries to come. God's the one that put that down that way. But why? Because in God's sight, it's already a done deal. It was accomplished. It was already accomplished in Genesis because Christ was foreordained before the foundation of the world. It was already accomplished in the Psalms. It was accomplished already in Isaiah. It was accomplished in Malachi. It was accomplished in all the verses leading up to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was already a done deal. It was just a matter of it happening. Just like we know that Satan is already a defeated foe. But it sure doesn't seem like he's defeated yet, does it? And we say, well, we've got the tribulation period, then he's bound for a thousand years, then at the end of the thousand-year millennial kingdom, he is loose for a season, and then is cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Amen. But isn't it already considered by God a done deal? Doesn't God already see His Word, His prophecies as fulfilled, even though we're waiting for fulfillment? So I think that's what we see when we look at the Scriptures here. We've got to remember, from God's vantage point, everything is already a done deal. They're a finished work. They're just, we're just waiting to see it happen. And many of the prophecies that are yet to come, we don't get to see them firsthand. And truthfully, I don't want to see them firsthand. Do you? So anyhow, I think that is probably the answer for that. All right, let's move to 2 John. Whole different change of gears here. Let's go to 2 John. One chapter, so chapter 1, verse 1, 2 John. The Bible says here, "...the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth." And not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Question 93, who is the elect lady? Who is the elect lady? There are two major views that exist. Now, there's a few other odd ones that are out there, but two major views exist on this. The first view is that this is a reference to the church. And so while we are the bride of Christ, such a reference wouldn't make sense because then who are the children of the church? You say, oh, well, that's the people that we lead to Jesus Christ. No, those aren't our children. Those are our brothers and sisters. God doesn't have grandchildren. He has children. So I think the reference to it being the church is, is not valid. I think there's more reasons why that's not the case than, than it would be. Uh, it also, in the context of it, I think he is speaking to a specific although an unknown and an unnamed woman. Uh, it seems to be the most reasonable and logical explanation, and that would also help us to understand 2 John chapter 1, verse 13. Because the Bible says here, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. So we have an elect lady, we have an elect sister. All of these have children. So what are we talking about? I think we're talking about specific women. This wasn't a sister church. And if it was, you'd still have to come up with some sort of an explanation as to who these children are. Now, I want to tread very carefully with the next comments here, okay? Uh, because as we explain what second, and by the way, what second John is about as a whole helps us to understand perhaps uh, who the elect lady and the elect sister is, that it's a person, not a church as a whole. Uh, again, in 1 John chapter 1, let's take a look at this. Well, actually, I'm, excuse me. In 2 John chapter 1, 2 John chapter 1, verse 1, we have the word truth in here. Four times throughout this little book, the word truth is used. Four times the word love is used. We've got that word in the first verse. And those two are absolutely inseparable. I think I am safe in saying that Women overall tend to be more loving, caring, compassionate, and tender. You agree? Overall, I'm not, I'm, there's probably some that aren't and some guys that are, but in general, 
Do you think that's a fair general statement? Would it be a fair general statement to say that ladies are more emotional? <laughs> be careful, I'm trying to be careful. They are more interested in deep relationships and friendships. Is that a fair assessment? Um, if you see a guy crying, that's unusual. And you kind of look like, you know, maybe give them a wide berth. It's like, oh, what's going on? What do you think when a woman's crying? Oh, what now? <laughs> right? Guys, right? It's like, oh, what's going on now? Because it's not unusual. It is a common, very ordinary thing, a, an almost an expected thing that a lady would, would have that soft, tender kind of a heart that expresses itself that way. And we definitely expect to see that. All right, if I haven't made you mad, hold your place here and move with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I want to set something up because I think this plays a part in what 2 John, the whole theme of that book really is. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, the Bible says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Let me read something to you out of the Believer's Bible Commentary. That way, if you want to throw tomatoes, you'll have to throw it at the author of Believer's Bible Commentary, not me. Um, at least I hope not. He says, they write this. They said, instead of approaching Adam directly, the serpent went to Eve with his temptations and lies. According to God's intention, Eve should not have acted independently. She should have gone to Adam and put the matter before him. Instead of that... She allowed herself to be deceived by Satan and fell into transgression. In this connection, it is noteworthy that false teachers today usually visit homes when the wife is most apt to be there alone. That is, when the husband will most probably be away at work. Why is that? Because you can work on her emotions a lot easier than the guy. The guy is going to say, get out of here. Just get out of here. Get off my porch. And the lady's going, oh, that's not very nice. you got to at least be nice. Guys, I, don't admit this, but has your wife ever said to you, be nice? You need to be nicer. You need to say that a lot nicer than you just did. Any guys ever been told that by your wives? Yeah, I have. Because we kick them off the porch right now. But the tendency is there for the ladies to be maybe a little bit more um, nice, okay, but um, welcoming. Maybe that's it, the welcoming. A little bit more welcoming. A little bit more, well, okay, I mean, you've come this far. Go ahead and tell me what you want to tell me. You know, I got all day. Just, just lay it out there. And... Um, you know, that kind of does seem to be the way the cults work, and they, they know what they're doing. Now, what does this have to do with 2 John? Go back to 2 John chapter 1. Let's look in verse 8. The Bible says in 2 John 1, 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. This little book deals with truth and love. And love is never expressed or exercised at the expense of truth. Never. And that is the warning that is given to this elect lady and to this elect lady's sister. Don't let these people into your home. Don't give your ear to them. Don't give them an audience. 
for the things that they are saying. Truth has got to win out. And if truth and love become in conflict, truth has got to win. C. Grant Richardson writes this in his commentary. He says, apparently, the elect lady exercised love at the expense of truth. She showed hospitality to itinerant false teachers, okay? Honestly, in your home, who's more apt to show hospitality? Who's going to be the one baking the cookies and let's put a pot of coffee on it and, and, you know, all this kind of stuff? Isn't that going to, in general, I'm speaking in general, some of you are going to get all rankled about this. In general, doesn't it tend to be the ladies that are like this, that, that have that kind of a sympathetic spirit about them? Genuine hospitality, he says, does not advance error. Love should never violate truth. Instead, genuine love upholds truth, and there is a close relationship between truth and love in the Scripture. And that is something that we have got to be very, very careful about. Again, in the Believer's Bible Commentary, John does not refer to casual visitors, but to anti-Christian propagandists. Should we invite them in, give them a cup of coffee, help them financially, buy their literature? The answer is that we should not receive them or greet them. These people are enemies of Christ. To show them hospitality is to take sides with those who are against our Savior. It is possible that sometime we might let such a person into our house without knowing that he denies the Lord. These verses would not apply in such a case. But when we do know a man to be a false teacher, it would be disloyal to Christ to befriend him. These verses do not apply to visitors generally. We often have unbelievers as guests in an effort to win them to Christ, but here it's a question of religious teachers who deny the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're thinking this through, you say, well, then how do we win them to Christ? How do you win somebody that's in a cult, out of the cult, and win them to the Lord Jesus Christ? And yet, be true to what 2 John is teaching. How do you do that? Uh, let me give you just some basic principles of why we can't let them into our home. The first reason is this. It's because it's your home. It's the only place you can completely guard and protect and safeguard. It's your home. You know what, gentlemen, especially because as God has placed us as the head of our homes, God has placed us in that role of protecting our homes. We have got to guard what comes in the doors of our house. That also includes through our televisions. That includes through our radios. That includes through the computers. We have got to put the guard up and protect it. We can't control any other place in this world. You know what? We really can't. But we can control our house. We can control what goes on there. We can control what music is played, what television shows are watched, what we do for fun in that house, the words that we speak in that house, the way we treat the people in that house. We can control that, and we must. It's our home. But the second thing is this. The elect lady has children. You don't want them exposed to the false teachers. You don't want them exposed to the things that are ungodly. And since there's a sister involved in the greeting, maybe the families got together. Maybe the cousins played. And so here's the sisters while the cousins are playing, and the false teacher is welcomed into the home, you know, because they've got something good to tell and share. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, why else shouldn't we let the false teachers in? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So the false teachers are the seducing spirits, the doctrines of devils. That's what they're bringing into your house. Why would you want that in your house? Wouldn't you want to keep your house free of that stuff? Um, Any more television commercials. You, don't even have, you say, well, I don't watch anything bad. How about the commercials? Commercials can be just absolutely vile. I cannot tell you how much I hate, 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 hate Halloween and that season. 
and all the commercials that start coming on are so uh, heavy laden with demonic stuff. And I tell you what, those things come on, a commercial of that comes on, and that tele- we are both racing for the remote to shut that off, to turn something else on. You say, why do you do that? Because I don't want that stuff in my house. I don't want Satan to have any access into my home. I want to protect that place. I sure don't want the devil in there. Back to the question then, how do we reach them? Go to Romans chapter 14 and verse 1. First of all, this is not something for a baby Christian or an ungrounded Christian to get involved in. If you would put yourself in the category of of baby, immature, carnal, or ungrounded, you got no business trying to go head-to-head talking with somebody that's in a cult. None whatsoever. Romans 14 and verse 1, the Bible says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. We talked about this verse a uh, number of weeks ago. The, word, the phrase, doubtful disputations, literally is judicial deliberations. When you are faced by the false teachers and cults, you are drawn into discussions that require a judicial decision to be made about what is right and what is wrong. And if you're not a grounded individual, if you're not grounded firmly in the Word of God and the truth, if you're not mature, if you are carnal, if you are a baby Christian, you're not able to be pulled into something like that, and it could do a lot of damage to you. So if you're in that category, don't get into those discussions with those people. You're not the one to go witness to them. Secondly, if you are able to talk to them, you've got the spiritual qualifications, if you will. Meet them in a neutral location. Go to a restaurant somewhere, a park, someplace that is not your home or anywhere near your home. Do something neutral. Third, let's go to the book of Titus, chapter 3. Titus, chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, verse 10. In fact, let's put it in context with verse 9. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, what does it say to do? It doesn't say keep going back and going back and going back and going back. Reject them. Seems like the Lord puts a time limit to even our exposure to the false teacher. So reject them. Fourth thing is this, keep your conversation gospel-centered with them. Keep it gospel-centered. Do what the Holy Spirit does. In John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, the Bible tells us that when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Keep it at what the Holy Spirit does. Work with the Spirit of God. Keep it in those areas. Keep it about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is He? And what did He do? Who is He today? What does He do? Keep it to those basic elements. The fifth thing is when they become argumentative or they begin to set you up into a debate. Follow Paul's example. Paul's example is in Acts chapter 19, verses 8 and 9. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So what it seems is that as Paul is speaking to them in the synagogue for those three months, he had the opportunity to do it. He wasn't being challenged and all that kind of stuff. But as soon as somebody in that group began to get their back up and began to stir up the crowd against him, Paul didn't say, oh, well, I've got to stay and keep defending this. Paul says, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Now, return to 2 John. Back to 2 John. Out of 13 verses in 2 John, eight of them deal with the importance of truth, and God's commands. 
Our interactions with those false teachers should be guarded very carefully so that we don't damage ourselves. So many Christians, churches, parachurch organizations have sacrificed truth on the altar of what they thought was unity and they thought was love. But in 2 John chapter 1, verse 11, For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. It, you didn't just show them hospitality. You didn't just welcome them into your home. You didn't just pat them on the head and say, have a great day after you fed them cookies and coffee. The Lord says you've now become a partaker of their evil deeds. I don't want to be a partaker of anybody's evil deeds, do you? So we've got these instructions that are given to us. It is a very dangerous thing to water down the Word of God and to fail to stand firm to the end. In our deacon meeting Monday night, uh, at the end, we got to talking and um, brought up a couple of names. There was probably other names, but these two stick out in my mind. One of them was John R. Rice. The other one was Oliver B. Green. And these are two men. They're now home with the Lord. But when you go back and you look at their ministry, these are men who uh, I think at least a couple of things stands out about them. I mean, besides the fact that they were just staunch defenders of the Word of God. The two things stand out. Number one is this. Their message never changed from the day they started to the day they died. It never changed. If anything, they got stronger. They never deviated. They never swayed. The older they got, I think, the more they dug their heels in because they were digging their heels in in the truth of the Word of God. It wasn't just stubbornness, well, I'm going to believe this, I don't care what anybody else says. They dug their heels into the Word of God. The second thing is this, their staunchness would not be accepted today. Too many in churches today want to try this, try that, change this, change that. Make things more appealing to this group, to that group. These men stood firm. They stood firm. We have been warned, Paul told us, in the last days... People would give heed to the seducing spirits. They would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears that they would not want to listen to sound doctrine. Folks, we're in that, that part of life right now in a big way because there's a lot of false teaching that's out there that does not line up with the Word of God. You and I have got to be ultra-careful. And I think maybe we've got to be more careful now than ever before because, and maybe I'm just glossing this over in my mind, I don't know, but it seems that there used to be a day where that which was false was in such contrast to that which was true. So it should have been pretty easy to figure out the difference. But today there has been such a morph, morphing of truth and error. And even by some of the people that you say, well, they ought to know better. They seem to used to know better. Yeah, but it's more comfortable to give in to what the crowd wants. It's easier to do that. And Christians, if we stand true to God's Word, we stand firm. We are not going to be the biggest church in town. We are not going to be the most popular church. We are not going to be the church that is the up-and-coming, hip-hopping. It ain't going to happen. But I'll tell you what, I would rather be where we stand upon the Word of God and don't deviate for anything than to be in a place that's lost its moorings, that's lost its anchor, that's capitulating to whatever the world's latest and greatest fancies are. We get flyers here at the church. I get them at home all the time of all the latest and greatest stuff that's out there. Just got something today in the mail. And it's like, yeah. And then we got to try the next latest and greatest thing. Then you got to try the next latest and greatest thing. 
You know, if you just go back to the book of Acts, it was all about the preaching of the Word and the Holy Spirit of God. And the Lord did a mighty, wonderful thing. Stay true to the Word of God. Tonight, if you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, but maybe you come week after week and you hear the same gospel message because the gospel message isn't ever going to change. The truth of the matter is that God's Word is what declares you a sinner, not me, not First Baptist. The Baptists aren't telling you you're a sinner. It's God's Word that's saying it. And it's the Word of God that's telling you that you are an at enmity with God. You're not His friend. You're not His um, close companion because you come to church and do all the things that we do here. You're at enmity with God. And you're on your way to an eternal hell, the Bible says. But the Bible also tells us that the Lord loves you, that He died for you. He paid the price of your sins. He was buried in the tomb, He arose again from the grave, and He is the only plan of salvation. If you want to be saved, you want to go to heaven someday, you'd better call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Today has to be the day that you would repent and believe the gospel. Would you do that? With their heads bowed and their eyes closed tonight, nobody looking around. But if you're here without Jesus as your Savior, and this it isn't my words, it's got to be from your heart. But if you can honestly pray something like this from your heart, and you mean it. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm on my way to hell. I don't deserve grace. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve love. I deserve exactly where I'm headed. But, I believe tonight Jesus loves me and that He died to pay the price of my sins on Calvary's cross and that He was buried in the tomb and He arose again from the grave and He lives and He is the only way, the only truth, the only life. He is the only way I can get to heaven. And tonight I repent of whatever it is I've been trusting to get me right with God, my good works, my my name, my church affiliation, whatever it is. And I trust Jesus and Him alone. I ask Him to save my soul. Has that been your prayer tonight? If so, you say, I've never prayed anything like that tonight. I've prayed that and I've meant it. With our heads bowed, eyes closed, we just slip your hand up tonight. Then our Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for Jesus. Thank You, Lord, for Your Word. Thank You, Lord, for the great promises in the future that we have. We know, Lord, that the, the best really is yet to come. It's not cliche. It's the truth. So no matter what we go through this side of eternity, Lord, it pales in comparison to what you have in store for your children. So, Lord, when we're discouraged, help us to run to you. When we feel that we can't get up another day, Remind us, Lord, that your hand is reaching out to us. If we would just slip our hand into yours, Lord. Thank you for the way that you heal and restore. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.